globalization of the routes is, is getting some crews back in place. And I know that's something that Jeremy and, and DJ have been talking to Amtrak about too, and trying to get our last Richmond route reestablished, um, but also the new services. We, we also plan to reintroduce, um, or I should say introduce a new route to Norfolk, um, which has actually been planned for several years, a third route to Norfolk. Um, we were planning to do that later this year, but because of some of the challenges they're having in starting up services around the country, we may have to push that back. But something we're working on with them. So it's new, new track. Yeah. Yes. And then in addition to that is the, the new route to Roanoke. That we also, um, we're, we're still planning. I'm hoping to be able to start that later this year, but a lot of it is going to get, uh, it's going to depend on some of the, their ability to get crews in place and get labor in place uh, for that as well. So we do hope to very soon be able to announce exactly when we think. Yes, there's no state of what's happening in Virginia 
real perspective. I mean, I'm not aware of anything, you know, Jeremy's actually very involved in our stage for passing the rail, but DJ as well coming from your track. I don't know if I mentioned that, DJ was behind that. Oh, great. <laughs> so I would say there are other states that have similar setups, but I can't think of a state that has made such a capital commitment and really an overall commitment to passing the rail as a motor train. Many of them are active with Amtrak and, and try to promote remote services, but I think they're in Virginia really. Have, have worked with Amtrak to change passenger rail from North Carolina, Virginia, or this board. So it, it is very important. Well, response just to the recommendation. So we um, kind of revived social uh, networks that I end up touching. One of the things that I, I and of course, you find yourself talking to patients, despite the fact that people like the women are interested. Yeah, we're living. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So, so my, my limitations will do that. But, but, but I find it interesting that there's very little knowledge on the part of the business community in particular of how transformational this investment really is. And I, I guess I'd say that because that word should get out. When we look at transportation, I would say the business community in Northern Virginia the focus is on road. Uh -huh. And um, I think we've gained much benefit from an information uh, education approach. So I brought to you this in particular, let them know this is. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, when we do actually sit down and discuss this completely, oh my gosh, I had no idea. It's, it's just amazing. So yeah. I think we've gained a lot. Thank you. That's helpful. I think in some ways, sometimes we don't, don't spend enough time talking about what yeah. we're doing. Well, we do think that the recent article on the post yeah. that featured the interview with Sham right. was a really good, like, let's open the door a little. Yeah. But I do think that there's a need to do more talking. And, you know, the Nova Chamber um, and yeah. Fairfax is sort of like the big place. And mm -hmm. to figure out, figure out whether they would sponsor something. Yeah. You know, because I do think. That analysis we did on 95. Shannon got it in the paper. She got it in the paper, but yes. you have to hear that story three or four times for it to really sink. So in. great. Was, yeah. part, was part of that discussion, Shannon, the fact that they should be recognized that you can't build in the United States? We yeah. know that. You can, but by the fact that as soon as you do their chocolate bar. I think to Mary's point, that's the first time we've seen it in the press. Yeah. I'm trying to walk in the street. So I think it's a talking point to keep. And I think we similarly on 66, there's a story there too about yes. that, you know, that we pushed out. There was a lot of fight about how much bigger that road could be and the transition which is this stiff, no more houses for a generation. That makes me already way more important as a community. Yes. So which reminds me, one of the things, um, thank you for mentioning 66. Um, and this is all really good feedback. And, um, one of the things that I would I would propose to bring back to you at our, at our next meeting or something after this is actually to talk about um, both 66 outside the Beltway and inside the Beltway and the rail element because we did do we updated the transit study um, I should I say last year but that was just, <laughs> nothing happened last year no, it was 2019 that was updated um, to to focus on the addition of BRE service that's um, because of this um, this whole initiative. So um, that is something that we should really bring back to you all um, and maybe the full CPT at some point too, to, to update everybody on. I think we did do maybe a general update on the transit study, but there's a good, there's a very good story there about how the whole thing fits together. Yeah, I think that, and I think we've revamped how we're spending the big DIN money yep. in some important ways too. And so yeah, I think that all, you know, and really the chair of the, the or now lives almost to Gainesville. Yep. And so, you know, they're, they're going to be, she's going to keep a push, I think. Yeah, she's been very supportive. Yeah. It's, good. it's great to see the sort of the shift in the, the board. So. The, the initial recognition of, of working at Longbridge and the critical mass that we had in the last year, you know, what it was during World War II uh, and how it was protected, how critical it is to be able to move from North or South. That started a real conversation. It was definitely a piece of my view. It was a perfect opportunity to expand the Yeah, definitely. It's, it's really it's exciting to see the whole thing kind of coming together statewide. 
it's hard to ignore it. You see these big lines on maps, but really the lens is still the, the bridge at the very top. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, well, I'm going to that come up and now give us an update on the um, organization and if there's anything else you want to update them on what's wrong. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I never expected such a warm welcome. <laughs> <laughs> it is summer in Virginia. I think we're on the rail committee for a week. <laughs> I'm DJ Statler. I'm the new executive director of ERA, group number nine. Uh, as Jennifer alluded to, I came from Amtrak. I actually grew up in the federal government. I was always in finance. And then my last tour in the federal government was about 12 years with the Federal Railroad Administration. And I say, once the railroad gets in your blood, you can't get back. So I left the Federal Railroad Administration, went to Amtrak as their CFO, moved from CFO to their operating officer to the chief administrative officer. So I, I spent about 12 years a day in track the executive branch. We worked a lot with the states and really getting a good understanding of the good, the bad, and the other as well. I came here again nine weeks ago, and one of the reasons that this was such an exciting duty, as you pointed out, is Jennifer and the team have really done a fantastic job of, um, so you think about like this weekend there's the US Open, golf. Jennifer and the team built the golf course. Perfectly then set the ball on the tee, and now we just have to do And that sounds easy, like, oh, we get the easy part, but really both parts are equally as hard. The way these projects are lined up through the Transforming Maryland Virginia program, where we've got the long bridge all the way down to what we're going to be doing down here, and then the Western Rail initiatives, it's really a tremendous opportunity to transform the way we make um, not politically, but I don't care where you come from politically. We can all agree that Drive 95 north of Fredericksburg is horrific. We're <laughs> looking to be avoiding at all costs. Exactly. Yeah, right. it's in the morning. Uh, <laughs> 5.30. Yes. If you're looking to get anywhere at predictable time, you want to stay off of I-95. And that's nothing against the VDOT folks that are doing everything they can. But as the article from Secretary Valentine pointed out, you build a lane by the time it's done. So this is a really a great opportunity to, to change the way people um, I wanted to just give a quick update. We're nine weeks in. We've done a little bit of fleecing from the ERP staff. We're going to keep that to a minimum, although there's just such there's just there's key talent there that really would be the linchpin to to make this project happen. The good news is is that in the nine weeks I've been here, the culture of ERP is just irreplaceable. Everybody's happy. Work together. They don't say my position is A and that's all I'm going to do. It's really all hands on deck when there's something that needs to be done. People will do it. And that's, that's really key to getting these projects. And you're referencing more traditional rail. Thank you. Thank you. When you made that comment. You made that comment, Mr. Austin. Quickly, I just wanted to give you an update. We, we came in with no organization. Charlie had some ideas, uh, but Mike, who was introduced earlier, was the chief operating officer. Gracious enough to come over to the RA to consider the CFO. We really did the executive team and we're working on filling out the ranks. As we're setting up this authority, we've got policies and things we're trying to put the board in place. Uh, we also have projects that are ongoing and they can't slow down. So we're doing the work at, at both times. This is just a, a high level look at what we think the organization will look like six months from now. As you can see, there are four direct reports to me, which is operating officer, which will be, which is my, will be responsible for the delivery of all of these projects. Uh, the chief financial officer will track funding, make sure that we know where money is coming from and where it's going, and that does that great rigor, and we'll also oversee our IT programs. Uh, Director of External Affairs will deal with all our community work, all our marketing as far as getting the word out on what rail is and what we are doing. Except from the marketing part of the rail, the 299 rail passenger from Amtrak. That work will be done as well, but that will be done under my opinion of contract management function of Amtrak. The strong partnership with Amtrak is key to getting riders back on the train and taking the train. Virginia, again, another success story. When the Lynchburg train started in 2009, I don't think anybody imagined in the wildest dreams how much it would really we want to get that rider back and continue that growth. And with the additional frequencies that this capacity will allow, we do that. And then finally, on the right is the services, which will oversee procurement, human resources, the hour lift to the OHG's office, and 
really handle all the policy and, and compliance. As we said earlier, the chief operating officer and the chief financial officer have retired. We are in a final stages of interview process with the chief administrative services. We have hired the RPT uh, director of human resources that ends on the 4th and 10th of July. Uh, so we're moving forward. Going a little bit deeper into my organization, which is I feel strongly that this authority will succeed based on how well we do these projects. For better or for worse, the railroads have a lot of history of doing capital projects. I remember a great presentation by a gentleman at CSX who talked about a bridge project that was a $50 million bridge and his slogan was much longer. But over the course of two years, they went back to the board three times raised the dollar amount from 50 to 85 to 105 to 125. And each time it was just a huge battle to get it. Then they delivered the bridge for $121 million and they all got awards because it was $4 million in the budget. So <laughs> because you're dealing with, with assets that are so old, you just don't have these ads built drawn and you don't know what you want to get. So the, yes, sir. And just a question on that as I look at these organizational charts. So we are in the <coughs> State's perspective, the unusual position of having three simple ownership of rail assets. That's brand new to us. And, and with that comes, I think, a special reform of the safety aspects of the role we play in moving people and, and, of course, in some cases, routes around the Commonwealth. And nothing that I've seen in the organizational charge so far have anybody specifically or any position specifically assigned to safety. How did that happen? You, you can't help but what's happening to our metro system in Northern Virginia, that apples and oranges to some extent. But this public safety aspects of this are going to be part of everything we do from the perspective of moving forward. How is that incorporated? So will there be a single point of reference for that? I would imagine that Mike's role held. So we've debated that as to whether we should have a safety person reporting directly to the executive director or directly to the C. Oh, oh, and as you can see on that chart, we do have a safety manager who is the one person responsible for the safety of all these projects. We are going to watch that closely because, to your point, one safety, it only takes one moment of inattention for something critical to happen. The railroad industry is a traditional industry, and anybody that's been with it for, for more than a minute has seen just sloppiness isn't even fair, just inattention caused just disaster. And we can't allow that. We've got too much responsibility. Thank you. I, you know, I'm sure we should only consider that as a direct report. It's such a critical component. And ultimately, that was mandated for. I was going to say, I was on the Metro Board during that time. So, um, having the direct report was an important part of the check and balance uh, system that we ended up with. No, that, that's good feedback because it's definitely something that we can want to do proactively if you do it reactively. It's obviously too. Yes, it's true. Thank you. So that's good feedback. Thank you. Because that's, as we deal with this, and a lot of these positions, we're not clear yet whether they're going to work for PGRA or work for consultants. Only because, as we said, in Long Bridge, for example, we'll probably be in eight different construction projects or something like that. And as we put these kids out, we're going to get feedback on whether. What our level of management will be and what the result will be. So, uh, this role will continue to evolve as we move forward, but you're absolutely right. Every decision we make has to have safety. So, just quickly on these four charts, on the left hand side of the chart under the engineering manager, that's where all the design work will take place, that's where the, the work for the communities with the tree, with CSX will take place, and then projects transition over to the right for the actual construction. Um, we feel, and we've done some work with benchmarking against other authorities and organizations that have delivered large projects like this. We strongly talk with our friends at VDOT who are going to be helpful in this journey. And this is the, the setup that we have seen most really successful. I will tell you this right now when I stand here six months from now, we will try to show you look very different just because if we put a line in the sand and don't change it, we're failing. We've got to evolve and just what we're happy to work out. Um, but we are going to move forward quickly on getting talented people in place because, as I said earlier, the projects haven't stopped. Just last month, or earlier this month, actually, we put out a big request for the Red County Bypass, which is critical as we move from one side of the right way to the other. Uh, those bids are due in July. We've got to continue moving forward smartly 
Secretary Valentine has made it very clear that the deadlines that we're not going to miss. And we're not, we, we are set up well to succeed. We just have to get that ball in there. So this is just the, the first update. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. And, uh, I'm surely going to be back in future meetings. To do. DJ. <laughs> so end this of your job. <laughs> DJ, question. Good morning, sir. Ray, back floor. Thank you. Will, will there be a project manager for the uh, extension to New River Valley and the enhanced service uh, along the 29 corridor? Yes. So the question I believe was is, is as we have talked about the focus on the eastern side, will there be a project manager specifically for the Western Valley Initiatives? And, and absolutely at least one project manager. We'll probably break this office up into multiple project managers. So I can assure you, sir, that the west side of the state will get plenty of cash. Ray is unofficially overseeing that project from his window. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just, just to be clear, yeah. operations low cost. Safety inspector operations. Yeah. Well, you might get, we'd actually we we had debated whether or not to add the Western Rail Initiative to this, but since we don't have a definitive agreement yet, when we have that, we will add it. However, we have already started the planning the planning process. Uh, Kate Young Booth and our planning team is, is responsible for the um, planning for the Western Rail Initiative. And specifically, one of the big focuses is going to be that station location that Director Mitchell mentioned uh, earlier on. So we have, we have already begun, Ray. Um, but when it comes to engineering and design, we do want to be too presumptuous since we still have. We want to, by the end of the year, try to nail down the definitive agreements with Building 7. Well, Mike, to just remember, it only took six years to build the Transcontinental Railroad. Six years to build the transcontinental railroad. <laughs> Different time. That's a good goal. <laughs> a good goal, yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Just one. Look, looking way to the future. So, you pair it, but so we have this oversight of all rail assets, obviously. Um, from a, a future planning perspective, th there are portions of the Commonwealth that, of course, are not served by pasture rail. Uh, and some of our more rural areas in the western portion of the Commonwealth are also subject to probably the imminent abandonment of some fairly substantial rail assets. In way in the future, um, if you're a part of your organization, you'll be looking at the viability of perhaps banking some of this. I don't know if that makes sense. It's been done in other states. I don't know how much has been resurrected. But when some of this right away is abandoned, as it will be with the drop off of coal traffic, it provides the opportunity for pennies on a dollar to buy rail assets that may or may not have a place in our future, but in the worst case, they could be um, recreational trails. So, I, I, and looking at the organizational chart, I'm not sure where this issue was looking towards the future would fall, but I know the western part of the state is going to see a dramatic decline in rail lines. That's actually something that DRPT will be looking at as part of our statewide rail plan. Um, and um, Emily is going to give us an update on the plan later, but rail banking is going to be part of that as well. And okay. and and I think also the most important thing will be having a process by which um, those kind of abandonments or opportunities can be evaluated, yes. whether it's for passenger opportunities or, as you or mentioned, some friends. other yes, yeah, some other or, um, or recreational purpose. combinations. Yep. Yeah. Exactly. Well, so that's I'm great. Not, if I'm not mistaken, to your point, the governor put five million dollars in his budget, uh, this past budget, uh, for rails to trails for and the Senate uh, put 40 million into it. It said 17 and a half for one, 17 and a half for another, and two million each, two other facilities. So there's a good bit of activity with this. And then the, the, the House came back and said, no, 40 million is too much. Let's use 10. And the legislature said, okay, uh, we'll use 10. But at the same time, we want to have Boyd be do a study. Uh, and that study has to come back uh, to the General Assembly by October 1 on what we're going to do statewide for rails to trails programs. So my only issue with that is the right of revision or to bring it back. So they're darn expensive. If you look at the investments made over hundreds of years by the railroads, those are darn expensive trails. Um, I'm fine if that's an interim use, but I would think anything we do in the future has got to be 
consider that ultimately they can be returned to their original use. My, my understanding is the Service Transportation Board oversees these assets from the rail standpoint. And when you abandon, and this has just happened on the Eastern Shore, attempt to abandon, uh, you have to go back to the Service Transportation Board um, to get their authority to be able to continue to operate it as a rails and trails program. And that, at least for the Eastern Shore, that's in play at this point. And they've just gotten an extension for another year, July 6th until July 6th of next year, to put in place what their ownership and maintenance and what have you is going to happen. This could apply to all the facilities that we're talking about the possibility of going rail to trail. But at the end, because it is a rail bank program, and it's in a rails to trail. So it's rail bank. It's rail bank, and, 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 and at any point in time down the road, uh, if there's an issue, Mr. Casper was wants to make a major investment on the Eastern Shore. You never know. Whatever. You never, you never, you never Potatoes know. are coming back. But, <laughs> but they can be brought back. So well, I think you know, that's the purpose of a rail exactly. trail is to protect the right of way. In, in many cases, it wasn't, though, Trish. And, and ultimately, they did things that diminished the potential for it, ever turning them back in the rail. So they cut sections out of them or took away critical structures. So you've got to start it with the expectation that we're going to maintain the core components of the system so that if we ever do revert, it's, it's reasonable to do so. Well, an example of that is the S-line that goes south into North Carolina. It's a perfect rail bank situation, yeah. but whether they did it by choice or not, but we have, um, in Northern Virginia, we have a rail line that comes through some of our prime suburban territories that turned into a trail, and there's no way. No way. That no way. way is coming back. And, and um, as you mentioned, OIP, OIPI will be doing this study. They are putting together a study group by which, and we'll be participating in that as well. I don't think they've met yet, but they, um, but that is something that we'll be involved with too. Because it, it does, it's got a lot of components. And, um, but I think the biggest thing is that they really do want to establish where do trails belong and, and what are our, our overarching policies towards developing those as opportunities arise. As I understand it, the legislature said, come back October 1, 2021 with the yeah. The key words is rail bank. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. Again, thank you all for your time. I look forward to uh, our next update. Um, so our next update is going to be from um, Jeremy. And um, so as you know, when we, um, the on transportation omnibus bill passed, um, it, it uh, re um, shaped our rail funding programs. And we now have a single Commonwealth rail fund, which is divided between um, VPRA and DRPT. So 7% of that is um, remaining with DRPT for free programs. And oh, Mike Todd will actually be in this work. And um, uh, so we are putting together, Mike and the team have put together some. Um, proposed uh, policies for using that 7% and having a grant program for that. So those will eventually, we want to first bring this to you for your review and input. Um, and those would then go to the full CTB for review and approval at some point too. So um, I'll turn it over to Mike now. Yeah, good morning. Um, just in case, I know I've worked with most of, most of you before, but um, I've been doing multimodal transportation in the state of Virginia for about 15 years now, both in the private sector and public uh, previously with the intermodal office uh, planning at DRPT and now I'm currently the rail enhancement manager um, at DRPT. So, uh, you know, my main uh, management responsibility has some big changes and so that's uh, you know, what we'll be going through today. Um, so there's, there's kind of two uh, components that I want to talk through. So the, the main purpose here is to get your feedback on our proposal for the managing the new program. Um, the, the first point, though, is that any existing REF projects, ones that were applied for under those guidelines, are going to be managed under the old guidance of REF. Um, you know, the grantees entered into those contracts with certain expectations, and, and so we're going to keep those as they are. Um, for the most part, those projects are with the Port of Virginia, their, their on-dot rail terminal expansions, um, and, and a few others around the state. And then the second part is, you know, what is our path forward? Uh, we have a proposal here that we'd like to get your feedback on um, so that we can open up uh, for our application cycle in this year in December. So then just to, um, just to make sure everybody knows exactly what funding we're talking about, I think you've seen chart, this chart or, or similar charts, you know, several times before, but um, as the, the omnibus bill 
kind of dictates the new tr transportation revenues. You see those, that orange box, it kind of trickles all the way down to that free programming and rail planning. And so this is the, you know, 7% of the Commonwealth rail fund that was created and goes to the RPT. Uh, four of that, four million of that 7% is set aside for rail preservation. And then the remaining funds of that 7% are for both statewide rail planning and for this new, you know, freight based program. And to put some numbers behind that, that 7%, you know, is about you know, nine to 11 million, depending on the revenue for the year. Um, and so, you know, you take 4 million off the top of that, you're talking about six or 7 million per year for both statewide planning and for the new program. So that's just to set us up, make sure that we know what, you know, what fund we're talking about. The that's proposal for the new uh, fund uh, is named the freight fund. So uh, one, we thought it'd be easy just to say the DRPT freight fund, but also the, the name has some meaning. So the acronym is actually the, the freight rail enhancement uh, to increase goods and highway throughput fund. Um, I gotta say that, <laughs> that took some time. Yeah. <laughs> But there are some specific purposes behind it. So one, we wanted to kind of harken back to that rail enhancement program that we had previously. You know, the, the program was built on uh, increasing network capacity for the uh, for freight rail. Um, two, we wanted to acknowledge that this really is about supplementing the highway system. You know, we're not trying to replace anything. We're trying to create a competitive multimodal network. And we feel that, you know, both the highway and rail have a place in that, in that multimodal network. And then, of course, you, you know, uh, any freight program is about increasing goods movement, increasing access to businesses, and freight rail does that just the same as, you know, any other freight program. So the name does have some meaning. Um, the code section I put up here, not to read through it for you, but just to note that when we operated under the rail engagement fund, we, it was very prescriptive, the code section. It was, it had multiple sections underneath code, it was very prescriptive about what we could do and how we could do it. This code section is much more open. So we can bring our expertise and lessons learned and your input um, more freely to the table and make this program you know, work the way that, that we feel it will work best, as, um, as opposed to having to stick to strict code-based guidance. Um, a quick snapshot of our typical grant cycle. So um, this summer, you know, we're adopting the SIP, we're notifying our grantees of their projects that have been awarded, we're reviewing the guidance, how do things work over the year. In the fall, we make some updates so that we can then open uh, the grant program uh, application period in the winter. That's true for all of our programs, rail and transit. Um, and then in the spring, we evaluate any applications that we receive so that we can then, you know, adopt the SIP in the summer. So we're, we're aiming to open up this grant cycle, you know, with the rest of our programs on December 1, uh, this winter. Is this a, on an annual cycle basis? Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. So a little bit more about the program process itself. Um, there are really four main stages. You have the application period, then we move into executing the project, uh, actually implementing, can, you know, constructing or designing the project, depending on the grant, and then we move to project closeout and performance. And there are details, obviously, in each one of these steps, which we're going to go through um, in more detail. Mike, just a quick question. When someone puts in an application in the winter, the, the funds are available after they drop out of the SIP. That's right. So this is an immediate dollar amount. Because a lot of what we do is our year funds. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it depends on funding availability, of course, and then also it also depends on the grantee schedule. So in some cases, we do get, you know, say an application in FY22 for a project that won't start until FY24. Um, so, but if there's a project that has an immediate need, and, and they can apply and then receive funding July 1. And just for clarification, so it's, it's our expectation that money will be primarily spent on the enhancement of the existing infrastructure. Seven million dollars. Oh, please. Well, I some of it will depend because I mean it's not um, the amounts are not huge as you can I, see. That, I guess that's and right. I, so we're also anticipating some planning work and and being able to. We'd also like to be able to help 
applicants on the project development process to get projects to a place where they're ready for design and construction and to potentially seek other sources of funding if it exists, whether that's there's federal grant programs, there's other smart scale, um, there's other you know sources of funds that they may have larger amounts. So we also anticipate that this program will be able to help with that and that might be a very good use of our funds. I would suggest that given the relatively small amount we have to spend the high dollars associated with any physical infrastructure, that'd be a great way to spend the dollars. I um, have often said at this committee meeting that um, you know, our ability to switch cars in Virginia is probably one of the things we should be tracking. We can go through siding enhancement discussions. Um, we've done a number of those during my time on the board, but that's a direct relationship to our ability to actually handle more rail traffic on an originating basis. Um, so if I had $7 million to spend, we could, could use that more towards the planning aspects or the support aspects of increasing our switching capacity within the Commonwealth. So rather than X number 300 active switching locations that turn to 500, then we've got capacity to absorb. What I'm seeing in my neighborhood is I'm seeing the switch sightings removed on the NS, on the line that runs to Front Royal. And I just, so it's a concern from that perspective. Um, I guess the best use of those dollars you know, will, will develop and evolve over time, but wait, we don't have the resident capacity to take cars off the line and to take the merchandise and materials off those cars or to originate that freight and ship it out of state, then you know, we're, we're, we're either a through system for product that's going elsewhere, maybe to the ports, or um, we're primarily, um, you know, <coughs> just an observation. Yeah, definitely. And I would say the additional thing that we're anticipating is that the um, historically the short lines were not big uh, applicants get program. However, this program is a little bit more tailored to their needs. Um, they have uh, smaller dollar value capital investments. And so, um, like you said, originating at a new business on a short line that needs a new siding it, it is something that's palatable within this program. Be perfect application for this, but but even at that full seven million would buy us maybe ten new sites based on the numbers that we've used in the past. So although we may be able to stretch projects into multiple crops, I, I think that's great. So yeah. it's exciting from that perspective. Yeah. Okay, so to start with application, there's kind of two components of the application. First, eligibility. So the, the you know the main purpose of this is network capacity expansion. And then uh, kind of to your point, Mr. Kasswitz, um the lesson learned is we need projects to be designed and ready for construction, whether that means going after other funds or coming back to the program later and knowing that we have a secure construction budget that's not going to increase once they actually get into the plan. So those are the two big components of eligibility. Um, just some things to note um, that are not eligible, things like railroad uh, operating expenses, passenger rail subsidies, um, and then also the work uh, keeping a holdover from REF, which is not matching with other state funds. So it can be, of course, matched with private funds, federal funds, other things like that, but other state funding seemed um, a bit like that double dip. If you're matching state funds with state funds, that um, it, that didn't seem um, uh, to be kind of in the vein of the program. And so we're keeping that holdover from REF as well. Second component of application is the scoring. And so this we've kind of stolen from all of our lessons learned in pro and different programs around the state over the years. Um, our intent for the way this would work is a lot actually like smart scale, where we do this objective scoring and we, and we can present that to you. But then you still have discretion within the program to say, you know what, this is much higher state priority. Let's, let's bump it up this year and provide funding. So, you know, our, our objective with the scoring process is literally just to give you the data so that you can make the right decision. Um, that scoring is based on a uh, benefit cost analysis, such as much like the REF uh, model that we've used in the past. We are uh, currently, we literally just contracted to update that model, not, not just update the data, but also update some of the components that we can evaluate. Uh, we also look at matching funds. This is kind of something we stole from the IPROC program. Uh, you get, uh, you don't have to bring any matching funds to the table but you don't get any points if you, if you don't. And the more funds that you bring, the more points you get. 
Um, so it really incentivizes having a bigger split between the public and private. Uh, again, project readiness we really want to highlight it. So we, you know, give you additional points to make sure that you brought your design uh, to a substantial level so that we don't get any surprises in construction. And then, of course, we also want to make sure that the project aligns with statewide goals. Um, so those are the, the, you know, the main scoring components totaling up to 20 points. We would then, you know, score and rank the applications and present them to you with, with, with those findings. So then moving into grant management. <laughs> grant management um, is kind of set up uh, to be as protective of public dollars as, as, as we can be. And so each one of the components within grant, ma grant management has a two-step process. So first with the project execution, essentially what we're talking about here is the paperwork side of things. So we have a two-step process. First, we enter into the agreement with the grantee, which allows them to spend um, some of the grant funds to further refine the scope, schedule, and budget. Then they present that scope, schedule, budget to us, and only until we approve that do we issue the notice to proceed for construction. So it's kind of a two-step process for project execution. Similarly, with project work, a two-step process, we have you know, on-site uh, oversight where we go out, do site visits, take pictures, make sure the work is, is being con conducted. Um, and then we also, it's a reimbursement-based program. So, uh, you know, they have to actually spend the money do the improvements, then submit an invoice, and then once everything has been reviewed and approved, we reimburse the grantee. So another two-step process to kind of protect public funding. And then finally, with project closeout, another two-step process. You know, first we hold on to contingent interest. Um, our proposal is to hold on to the contingent interest for six years to kind of match our six-year program. It's reasonable. Um, yeah, one of the biggest hurdles that we heard was that a, the long period of continuing interest was a barrier to application. Um, so we've adjusted that to meet our own state, you know, planning kind of horizon. And then the second step process for project closeout is the reporting. So that's that same, uh, you know, car load reporting over the um, network that has been improved so that we can get a better understanding of how many car loads and what the network capacity is over, over the years. And then that will follow that same six year horizon. So we have that kind of two step process, you know, to make sure that we're being as judicious as possible throughout the management cycle. And then finally, just for next step, you know, we wanted to present this to you to get your feedback, see if we need to make any changes ultimately, uh, we would like to get this approved so that we can then incorporate those improvements into, you know, back end IT infrastructure and things like that so that we can open the application winner on December 1. So we could follow on with that suggestion, I don't have too much time on this, but it, it would be so helpful in future discussions to look at our total existing inventory of operable rail sidings in Virginia as one metric. Those that are active actually switching cars as a second metric. We compare that on an annual basis as an increase in the decrease because we're only going to be successful with freight programs if we've got a place to receive and to ship goods. And to me, it's the ultimate metric in this discussion. And this program can go a long way toward helping with the planning and some of the facilitation of that rather than actually putting in the site. So I strongly recommend that those metrics be the ones that help guide the process. If we're increasing, we're winning and, and improving the situation. Well, one thing that stuck with me is we've been having this conversation as well. And, and as Mike was walking through the slides, he's looking at our scoring process. And, and I think our scoring process right now is a little bit more focused on a, a construction project. And so I do think that we'll need to, um, in light of the conversation we've just had about planning and project development, look at how um, those types of projects get evaluated for the context of our yeah. scoring system. But that's something we can look at after this as well. Well, and you know, one observation I would make is, you know, you, you're giving points for a statewide goal alignment, but I, but I actually think uh, a criteria, an eligibility criteria, should be that it addresses at least one of the statewide sure. goals. Like yeah. you shouldn't be able to bring a project in that's that where you can't draw that nexus in, from the very beginning. Um, it's kind of easy to do if you think about. It. Yeah, yeah. I, I think so, and and. So, uh, and I, I, you know, going back to our safety conversation, I don't know if you want to think about safety as an element 
times one and two, that uh, safety being slightly different. I mean, it's not only accidents, but it's, uh, you have to slow, you know, does it really slow the traffic or will it, you, you know, can you give some points for moving more efficiently? I would think the audience for this is going to be almost exclusively short lines. There's yes. you know, given limited funds and, and you know the application processes. So there's so much we could do to help short line that capacity. Yeah, I would I would imagine yeah. short lines at the port. And the port, of course, yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, right. In, in the past year or so, uh, I'm sure everyone will recall that we have approved several. Um, siding enhancements of whatever, one on the Buckingham branch, one on the Shandor Valley. Uh, would those sorts of projects now come through this process or is that a different process and part of money? Well, we will still have our preservation program. Um, the preservation program grants though are limited to at least 450,000. Um, yeah. So there may be, and those are more focused on state of good repair as opposed to capacity expansion. Um, and so, but I think th those projects, though, I think were those already up to the Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, so the 450 cap is for rail industrial access. Oh, I'm sorry, the so rail preservation is a, a state of good repair program. Um, those capacity projects like the siding on Buckingham Branch yeah. absolutely be, um, would fit into this program. They also don't have to. There are other sources that could, you know, be pursued. Sure um for those so they, they are eligible they wouldn't have to thank you so um if we have we will take the feedback that we've got here these are really good comments i think mary your your, your comment about eligibility is similar to vtrans you know you have you have to be on four yeah. or statewide significance you know to to, to be to make it in right so i think that's a good um, some good feedback for us as well, and, and um, as well as looking at how some of these other planning projects might fit in. So that great, thank you. Awesome, thank you. So, um, Emily's going to give us an update on the statewide rail plan, which actually also builds on some of the conversation we, we already had. Mm -hmm. Um, I, the one thing I'll note about time, um, I think we've got about a few minutes left, a quick update on the, um, the preview of a presentation you'll be getting in the workshop on the rail industrial access application in um, um, Hampton Roads. And so that will be a very quick item and, and we won't go through it because you're going to see it again um, later today. Um, but we'll make sure that we all get a break before today. <laughs> So I'll try to go fast too. Emily Scott, manager of rail planning. Nice to see everybody again. As well. It's time for another rail plan. <laughs> so it's up in a DRPG. This is the third uh, rail plan that we've done. So um, it's really exciting to kind of have some experience with this and uh, especially with all of the, um, the new developments of transforming rail in Virginia. Uh, there's, we have a lot more, we have a lot more to say. And uh, we have a lot more to say when it comes to policy, especially. Uh, we have gone from being a facilitator in a lot of instances, and now we're more of a driver. And, um, and we certainly want to be um, looking at policies that can help the UPRA with, um, with implementation. So um, we, this is our, our um, plan for development. We're still in the scoping and visioning process. And our manager, uh, the project manager for the rail plan this year is, um, is uh, Nick Ruiz. And um, he's on our rail planning team. So he's doing all the heavy lifting and, and may be able to answer some of the further questions that, that you all may come, come up with. But I'll try to move fast and, of course, always available for questions if there's some follow up that you're, that you're looking for. So, uh, a quick overview of um, you may be asking well, what's BPRA's role in, in rail planning? What's DRPT's role in rail planning? The, um, we will keep a rail planning division within uh, DRPT. Um, we are the FRA, um, FRA recognized state rail transportation authority. 
um, for poor rail planning. So um, we're looking at, um, at the long term rather than um, rather than short term, and, and the rail plan of course falls um, falls right into that. We also um, I participate in the the B Trans working group. Uh, that meets about once a month. Um, so we're involved in that process too, from Boise and the and, um, you know, multimodal transportation level. And we also maintain the, um, the state's rail GIS um, layer. And um, Nick has been very instrumental in getting that set up. We used to really depend on FRA for that. And, um, and now Virginia houses its own GIF layer. We share really? it with um, BDP. So we have the permission on those sidings. Well, we need to enhance <laughs> it. <laughs> we need to just go make you see it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 So that was great feedback. It's a lot of work that's been done by oh, the administration. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Absolutely. So we can be measuring that. It's a great thing to be measuring year after year. And one of the things that the FRA requires um, is that we look at um, at some of the same data points year after year so that we can measure our progress, uh, measure trends. And so it's really exciting to be doing this for the third time and actually have, have some trends. And, um, and that's something that we, that we can be adding to what we measure. Just, just a comment, that there's subscription services for satellite services that will allow you to take specific geographic areas and car counts as well. So the part that's missing is we don't have cooperation from the major railroads about how many cars actually go you can get a weekly or daily count from subscription services. So that's exciting to check out the GS. So like I said, we are looking long term. Uh, we're looking at a four-year horizon, 20-year horizon. And um, and part of the guidance that we get from FRA helps us to look to also um, uh, measure um, our progress and, and data points state to state, not just year to year um, in Virginia. And we do this plan every four years. So it's on a similar cycle to the uh, some differences between the last rail plan and this rail plan, obviously transforming rail in Virginia is one of the biggest, and, and so I've talked about that a little bit, that we've gone from kind of a facilitation role, um, and, um, and now we're, we're looking at being more of a driver for policy. So we, we will see some, some policy updates and some new policies coming out of this, and we definitely want to get your feedback on, so we'll be coming back to you. Uh, rail trails is one of them, and, um, and rail preservation, rail banking. Uh, but another one is we want this to be more of a um, people-focused plan, something that's easier to navigate, not just one big document that you have to download it takes 20 minutes and, and print off, you know, to be able to, to read. I want you, I want you to be able to reference it and, and, and bounce in and out of things. Um, so Nick is designing it so that that, that makes, it makes it a little easier um, to do that online. Uh, so statewide rail plan and VTRANS. Of course, VTRANS is Virginia's multimodal transportation plan, and you'll be hearing more about that each day. Um, so they identify, we, and, and BRPT along with them, uh, vision and goals, midterm and long-term needs for the movement of people and goods. So the rail plan uh, will address those midterm needs, those long-term needs, um, in the project list that we that we end up with. And of course, our guiding principles um, are will align with, um, with what VTRANS does. So I'm going to highlight some of the major elements of the rail plan. A service development plan is one of those. Uh, in order to answer a lot of the trends and, um, and demographic questions that uh, the FRA requires that we answer in a rail plan, we really need to look at service development planning. And this year we're doing it um, in an even more robust fashion than normally we are doing some, um, some high level modeling uh, because we want to see what type of service we might be able to run post 2030. So all this infrastructure that we'll have as part of Transforming Rail in Virginia, you know, we've got milestones out to 2030 that you all are familiar with now in terms of service, but um, what could that get us later on? Um, and, and let's look let's beyond that. So that's one of the elements that we'll be looking at that we were going to be doing separately from the rail plan and, and COVID hit and we ended up um, folding it into the rail plan, which I think I think would be good. It will be a good way to highlight it for FRA too. Um, so that's something to look forward to. We're going to be working on that data um, collection and number collection over the summer. Um, so we'll be coming back to you in the fall with some, some results of that. Um, and then, of course, policy. I mentioned being a driver of policies. So these, this is a laundry list of the different policies that we plan to tackle in this real plan. We had a station stop policy that we um, that we unveiled 
um, in the 2018 version. We're going to be building on that, and I'll talk about that in more detail in a minute. Um, but we're also going to be talking about these elements, um, that rails with trails, Virginia-owned corridors um, is one that we'll look at, uh, mode of propulsion, in other words, electrification, um, kind of have some have some policies around that. We get questions about it a lot. It would be really nice to be able to know um, what our state's position is, is, um, is a lot of um, technologies are, are going to electricity and transportation, especially um, uh, fair pricing policy is something that we could look at and kind of be a research arm for um, for BCRA um, and uh, environmental sustainability and facility environmental standards is, is something else we can look at. And a lot of these have come from comments that we've gotten over the years. I have a folder on my computer. Every time I get a question from someone, even if it's not real plan time, if it's not something that, that directly relates to a study that we're working on now, I put it in the to deal with. <laughs> so a lot of these have come from, come from that. Um, this is our station stop policy that, that you're probably familiar with and you've seen many times from the 2018 plan. I definitely want to put more meat on this and also make sure that it reflects the current conditions. Can I ask for just in our for a moment? Um, we sent out yesterday a matrix of, um, in anticipation of this conversation, um, because we have had a lot of questions about station policies and, and and now that we have VPRA and VPRA ownership of substation elements, um, it, it really brings into um, focus that we, we we need to have a clearer policy. And, and now that VPRA is going to have a role in using some of their own funding on station upgrades, you know, how do we want VPRA to prioritize station improvements? We've got ADA that we have to deal with. We've got safety issues. I mean, the ADA has got to be our top priority. Um, and we have a number of stations. Um, with that, VPRA has already incorporated information in the budget for that. Um, but there's also maybe opportunities that come around, come available um, for more expansion um, needs. That you know, VPRA may also want to be opportunistic about purchasing a property or something like that at the station facility if it's not available. So, so anyway, this is going to help inform that. Um, as you may have seen, if you had a chance to look at that matrix there, it, the, there's no consistent ownership pattern. Sometimes the platform is owned by the Amtrak, sometimes it's us, sometimes it's VRE. It's, it's all over the place and it really just reflects how these, each station evolves over time. So, so anyway, that's, that's one thing that I think is going to be important for CTB to be able to set that umbrella, set that for VPRA, so that VPRA also has some guidance as they're moving forward in figuring out how to prioritize their funds for stations and station upgrades. So thank you, Jennifer. That's an important um, part of this policy. Um, so it's definitely expanded its reach. Uh, and, we'll, and yes, we'll, we'll be putting out some general policies that the VPRA will be able to refine um, as, they, as they implement their work. Uh, but we would like to touch on ADA responsibilities. Those are number one, front and center, um, state of good repair prioritization, service expansion station development also. Um, so we are working right now on an ADA priorities paper. And this is something that it will be incorporated into the rail plan, but it's really needed before we have um, the rail plan finished. So we, we're, we're doing that on a separate trajectory. And actually, um, Randy Sellett, um, who is probably joining us by, um, by phone today, um, is working on this paper as we speak. So um, it'll establish some first priority needs for our ADA compliance because um, you know, as soon as this, the property changes hands, if there are elements that are, that are owned by the state, we then inherit the, the ADA responsibility. So we're working with, um, with Amtrak very closely and FRA. Um, we're identifying those stations and, and, and the improvements that are needed. So we want to find out, um, we want to prioritize our ADA needs as, as part of this. Uh, we want to have buy-in and, and review from FRA and Amtrak, and uh, of course that'll that'll help inform the um, the ABA station policy for the for the statewide rail plan as well. Um, and so, really quick, this is this is a kind of a follow-on to the matrix uh, that, that Jennifer sent out. So this is a list of um, of Virginia stations that, as a result of Commonwealth ownership of station elements. Um, uh, will be taking more responsibilities. And of course, some of those stations have VRE service, some of them have, um, have, have Amtrak service, some of them have both. So, um, so this is a list of the kind of the, the global list of stations that, that we're looking at as part of this study. 
and then it's it's sort of like a funnel because um, some of those uh, because we don't own station elements that we're responsible for right away we, we want to make sure we're prioritizing so this is our, our next screening um, these are the Amtrak stations that will have Virginia responsibilities so Ashland Charlottesville Petersburg Richmond Staples Mill and Stanton those are those are priorities because we will have um, have responsibilities for those so we'll have an obligation to provide Amtrak with ADA compliant facilities and make those ADA improvements for any stations that are not currently compliant. Um, so we, uh, and as you see here, Charlottesville, um, that that's going to um, transfer over in 2027. So that one is is, um, is or up to 20. It could be before this, but 2027 is we have a seven, we have seven years to acquire that. Right, and so these stations are already have improvements going on. They're not. They're not stations that we've been ignoring over the years, and neither has Amtrak. So there are some current projects that are underway at each each one of these, or some, some current work that's underway at each one of these, because Amtrak does have a plan um, for ADA compliance, and they're they're um, on a rolling basis doing improvements throughout the country. So Ashland, they're almost finished with their improvements. Charlottesville, um, they just put some um, um, ADA improvements out to bid, and uh, and they're getting ready to um, to do some. Um, some work on those in Charlottesville. We'll be we'll be working with them, um, and in Petersburg, uh, there is work going on right now um, in partnership with Chesterfield County and Amtrak. Staples Mill, uh, DRPT is working on some um, some future design uh, for expansions at um, at Staples Mill, and we're also um, currently working with Amtrak on on ADA compliance. And then in Stanton, the, the lease in Stanton is um, currently under negotiation, and, um, and we're working with Amtrak there on, Amtrak, on um, ADA improvements. Uh, these are the priority stations, though, because they're not quite as far along as the others in terms of ADA improvements. So this is really, um, these are our top priorities. And so the next month or so, we'll be looking at, well, we have cost estimates for what we think we need. For ADA improvements, we need to make sure that those are all in line with what Amtrak um, uh, has, has has looked at in the past, and um, and and we'll get sign off from from FRA as well. Yes. So there is funding that is available through BPRA right now, but we want to make sure that there's enough, and so. Part of the purpose of this exercise, part of the urgency of this exercise, is to make sure that um, BPRA is is going in with um, with a clear understanding of what the responsibilities are in the short term, so that they can budget um, come August. And, and those yeah. those were they based on right. some estimates that Amtrak had given us. Right. So, and I think Ray might have a question. Sort of. Right. Yeah, yes. Thank you, Emily. Um, my understanding, which you can. Uh, uh, validate or not, is that a raised platform for boarding and uh, unloading can only be located on tracks that are not in active freight service. Is that correct? That's correct. And we are looking at, um, in some instances, uh, or for some of these stations for long term improvements, looking at, at building sightings. Um, Passenger rail signs. So yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that because accessibility is greatly challenged if you do not have an elevated platform. It can be uh, almost demeaning to the person who needs the uh, front end loader approach to getting on and off a train. And I hope that we will fully explore opportunities to erect. Um, platforms that are level to the train going forward in the future. Um, yeah, thank you, Ray. The, the one thing I would like to note about high platforms is um, there's just some stations where it's not going to be possible to build a, a right. site. Like right, like such as Fredericksburg or Alexandria or some other places where um, Stanton has is also very constrained. So there right. may be places where um, and we know that FRA will require us to put in high platforms where they're um, where it's possible or feasible, um, and but there's just going to be other places where it's just not going to be cost effective or, or possible to, to do that. And and one of the things that I would like to see happen, especially since we're looking long term, 
is um, is different technologies that we could use to avoid that front front end loader situation, which I've seen before. It's not it's not a condition that that um, that is good for the long term. So um, it, that's important to us too. So we do have a few other station policies that that were um, that we're looking at. Um, obviously, the priority right now, especially to get in the budget for BPRA, is the ADA improvements that I talked about. Then uh, we'll be looking at state of good repair and capacity improvements would be, would be the next priority station development and service expansion. So uh, we don't want to forget those items as well. And I know I need to wrap it up. So um, we'll be back with more information. This is our plan development process. So, uh, this is the end. Thanks. Emily, um, one trip to Tony, safety and sustainability. Uh, two, I guess. Uh, environmental sustainability is a key policy. Um, the reality of rail transportation is that it's inherently more efficient than many of our transportation mechanisms. Um, but it's one of the hardest to convert to some alternative fuel source because of the energy density required to move a fully loaded freight train or passenger uh, string of cars. The uh, aviation industry and the rail industry are working towards alternative fuels that are either not petroleum-based or mixes of petroleum-based and man-made fuels, if you will, that have significant environmental benefits, uh, as well as the diesel engine manufacturers working towards more efficient diesel engines. I can foresee a time in the future where the implementation of those from the freight railroads that we deal with will be based on straight financial metrics. If, if it takes this much safe or this much money to change these fuels in maybe 10 or 15 years before we can initiate these carbon reductions. I think it'd be really helpful if we track that as a separate component of this rail plan, because we may find in the future that one of the least expensive ways for us to start to offset carbon emissions and reduce our, our total tons of greenhouse gas emissions may be to buy down some of those investments. Uh, certainly Amtrak is working towards creating efficiency in this area, but the freight railroads are independent and they're going to make simply financial based decisions on these things that could have, I think, significant impacts from improving the air quality and uh, commonwealth. So we track that as a separate component of this on the sustainability. It's probably the biggest item that we're going to encounter from a um, reduction of greenhouse gas emissions in the next two decades. And this way we can be involved in that discussion with the railroads and say, you know, if you'll give us 10 million tons of reduced um, emissions, we're willing to pay X number of million dollars for that. And it may be one of the cheapest ways we can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So it's very exciting, a lot going on. We should be in that game with them. That's great. Well, well so we're taking notes for the environmental sustainability policy. Thank you. We'll get back to you on that. And then, I'm sorry, but one last comment. So I would hope that the negotiations and engagement we've had with both NS and CSX led to a, a, a more cooperative environment between um, you know, state as, as a whole and um, these private industries. And one of the things I think that we'll really benefit from is if we continue to leverage the relationships that were built, um, sharing of information, sharing of ideas and resources, especially on sustainability and service levels. I, I just think there's kind of a new chapter being written here because we have now been engaged in cooperative rail asset purchases that benefit both parties in that process. So mm -hmm. it's an important part of this that we emphasize. We've got new partners now where in the past they may have been, you know, engaged with us, but not on what I call a full partnership basis. So and Emily, I don't know if you, um, when, when we look at the whole plan, I think uh, building off of what Scott said, we're kind of in a position to have a different set of evaluative metrics. And we're in a position to get an annual report. It's kind of like we've been talking with the commissioner about mm -hmm. how many more lane miles did we add and how big you numbers. Know, big, yeah. The, yeah. So, sort of this big picture of what does progress look like. So, you know, just really think through them. And so, uh, we, know what, we, know what, we know what progress and success. When you look at the 18 plan, it's kind of like tick. We did this document, tick. We made this policy. I think this is more. How are we meeting? Yeah, that'll be very helpful to have um, have this result in more tangible metrics so we have that use in the future. And then I think you can start to feed into your grant programs and some of the other things. You know, um, I know this is the rail plan. 
but you know the other thing that we've kind of innovated around in the last couple of years is is this longer haul bus and I guess my question is where is that in all of this work that we're doing because that's that's another innovation where we don't have rail um, no that's that's a very good and we did the, we did a plan to look at um, expanded corridors for the Virginia Green service and we instituted two new um, routes um, and which connected parts of the state that were very underutilized. Um, the I-81 committee did also just approve um, some funding to extend new service to out to Bristol and points south of Bristol North. Um, and um, and I, there is some, I believe in VTRAN, some discussion of, of inner city bus and where there may be opportunities. Um, but um, I do hope actually, I, I think we get a lot of bang for the buck out of that expansion of the free service especially now that we have several lines in place it's actually very cost effective for us to kind of keep building on those contracts to add more service so. you know if, if it's anything like what happens in more dense places where you start out with regular bus and then you move to express bus and then yeah. you've built the case of the ridership to move to light rail or to move to i mean I, that's kind of how i see this is it's proof of concept uh -huh. that people will take a multi-person vehicle instead of taking a car yeah and it becomes a strong argument for them investing so it kind of i feel like it doesn't it doesn't Please. exactly fit here but it is a precursor to other kinds of expansions that you might consider so um i don't know where like i said i don't know where it goes but i think it's an idea that we need to yeah, no, that's that is that is a good idea about talking about how how those markets get identified and tested. Yes, yeah. exactly. Bus is a great way to test. Yeah, not a big part of the infrastructure investment. This is certainly the world of big data. It's now it's time for the new program to take to, to make sure that we start with the program and know where we want to go with this one. Be able to capture the data that we have and what we need to be able to make these intelligent decisions. Yeah. Good. Well, I know we are. Uh, we have a little bit of time before um, the break. Jeremy, is there anything you want to say in 30 seconds about the industrial access program? Sorry, I'm not going to say anything. Yeah, anything, that, anything they should keep an eye out for. I think just on this one, if it did score well, and the main thing we're trying to drive home about it is that this was um, something so different than an increase in rail traffic, big increase in rail traffic, and the port. Past investments in rail access at the port was really key to winning the site. So you look at there have been expansions of this type in the story market because of shale gas down on the Gulf Coast is good for So I think there's a lot to talk about here and I'll talk about that. Good application. Yeah. I, I believe have you both been out for a second? I, I, I've been there and I'm blown away. What you're doing is yeah, I follow John's comments. I've been there as well. Yeah, I've driven, driven by it. I haven't been in it, but it, the old Ford, Ford manufacturing plant plus a huge warehouse expansion. Yeah, good. Then this is a good story also for nation with DETP. You're talking about trucks. Trucks were backed out of the gate, down the road, all those to the Really? And this additional capacity is just going to be. And they put seven million dollars in the in the rail, mm -hmm. and, you know, four hundred contracts. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a small amount of funding on our part, but it's a big project. And, big and would, would they project. build it without our four hundred fifty? Yes, but there's other investors involved in that. Right. And to, and to that point, I would just say that there's there's a number of incentives that are different for each DEP and the port. So this is a piece of it's a package that the state offered yeah. them to be. Yeah. Feel free to make that uh, comment if um, <laughs> any other CCP members ask that question. Well, I know one or two that might. Yeah, um, so we're going to go ahead and wrap, wrap it up. Um, Ray, good to hear you. Um, and um, But thank you again. Um, we look for. I'm, I'm really excited we're going to be starting up these meetings again. Um, and uh, it's nice to be able to have a deeper dive into these issues. Yes. All right, Ray, thank you so much. Thank you. Eight minutes now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs>